Hello, thank you for watching part two of the lecture on the Odyssey books 13 through 18. Book 16, Father and Son. So here we get the finally the long-awaited reunion between Telemachus and Odysseus. So it begins with Telemachus arriving at the swineherds as he's been directed by Athena. And note how warmly Eumaeus welcomes him and pay in protect in particular attention to the simile that the poet uses, the narrator uses, to describe Eumaeus' greeting of Telemachus. Straight to the prince he rushed and kissed his face and kissed his shining eyes, both hands as the tears rolled down his cheeks. As a father, brimming with love, welcomes home his darling only son in a warm embrace, what pain he's born for him and him alone, home now in the tenth year from far abroad, so the loyal swineherd hugged the beaming prince. And as a good prince should, Telemachus asks about the foreign guest that Eumaeus has staying with him. Eumaeus says, well, he's had a rough time. This guy, he can tell you his story, but I'll put him in your hands. You tend to him as you like. He counts on you, he says, for care and shelter, since Telemachus is the prince and Eumaeus just a lowly swineherd. Of course, Telemachus feels despair at this because he cannot give the hospitality that he wishes he could. Shelter? Oh, you mayest, Tele Telemachus replied. That word of yours, it cuts me to the quick. How can I lend the stranger refuge in my house? I'm young myself. I can hardly trust my hands to fight off any man who rises up against me. Then my mother's wavering, always torn two ways. So she's stuck between trying to mourn for her lost husband and deal with the suitors. So Telemachus, what can he do to help this stranger? His own situation isn't as good as he would like, so what can he really do to help someone else? Telemachus sends the swineherd off to notify Penelope, tell her that her son has come back to Ithaca. And when he departs, Athena restores Odysseus. She gives him back his beauty and good looks. And Telemachus, of course, is, is stunned by this. He says, who are you? Are you some, some god? And Odysseus says, no, I'm not a god. I'm your father. And so we get, of course, the tearful reunion as they hug um, and cry the two, uh, the father and son who haven't seen each other for 20 years. And as Athena had hoped, they begin to plan for revenge. And Odysseus asks, come, give me the full tally of these suitors. I must know their numbers, gauge their strength. Then I'll deploy this old tactician's wits, decide if the two of us can take them on. And then he asks, if you are my own true son, born of by my blood, let no one hear that Odysseus has come home. You and I alone will assess the women's mood. So Odysseus says, let's, let's plan, let's see if we can take them on, but don't let anyone know I'm here. We have to test everyone, especially the women and servants. And meanwhile, back at the palace, we see that the suitors have heard of Telemachus's return and they are angry, of course. So the very suitors that Telemachus and Odysseus are now plotting revenge on, they themselves are complaining that they should have just killed Telemachus when they had the chance. And Penelope, in a moment of one of her moments of boldness, um, significant moments in the second half of the poem, she chastises the suitors for plotting against her son for their wicked ways and their lack of hospitality. And so that's the end of book 16. Some questions we should consider. First, how does this book further develop the significance of Eumaeus? Thinking about his um, greeting of Telemachus at the beginning of the, of the book and how pow passionate and powerful it was. What role does Eumaeus play as, as a lowly swineherd, but why is he important to the lives of the more heroic characters? And what does this tell us about the way the heroic code functioned within a larger social context? And how does Eumaeus serve as sort of a counterpart or comparison or alternate father figure for Telemachus? Uh, how does he compare to Odysseus or in some ways perhaps foreshadow the reunion between Odysseus and his son? Thinking about that moment of recognition, how does Telemachus react when he finally knows that this is his father? And what words or phrases, what images seem most important or meaningful in this interchange between father and son. 
How does it compare to previous scenes where Odysseus was revealed or someone else's identity was revealed where there was a recognition? And you might keep this in mind for future recognition scenes in the rest of the poem. And why is it that Telemachus alone is allowed to see and know Odysseus? Why not Eumaeus? Why not Penelope? Why not any of the other servants? Why only his son? What's important about that? Thinking about the nature of masculine idea, uh, identity and Odysseus's goals and his ultimate goal, what it means to be a good king, hero, and father. And why is it that Odysseus feels that he needs to test all the others? And keep in mind what happens, how are they tested, and what are the results of the tests that he gives to both Penelope, his fellow servants, the suitors, and so forth. Book 17, Stranger at the Gates. So Telemachus sets out and returns to the palace ahead of Odysseus. And his old nurse was the first to see him, Eurycleia. Tears sprang to her eyes. She rushed straight to the prince as the other maids of great Odysseus flocked around him, hugging him, hugged him warmly, kissed his head and shoulders. So this is a counterpart. This is a, similar to what we've seen when Eumaeus greets Telemachus, the, the old servant, but that loves the, the, their master almost as their own child. He then greets his own mother, Penelope, who um, is, uh, of course, distraught over things that have occurred, but she's happy that her son has returned and she wants to know his news. Uh, and he recounts his travels and news that Odysseus may be alive. He's heard that Odysseus still lives. And Theoclymenus, the, the seer, uh, says, oh, Odysseus is here. I know he is here. I can feel it. I have seen it. And he's right now planning and plotting to return to his palace and take it back from the suitors. Um, Penelope is, of course, uh, very uh, hopeful about this. She says, I hope that that is, that that is the case, uh, although she still remains doubtful. We, of course, <clears throat> know that this is what's going on, that he is making his plans, just as the seer has told. Odysseus is led into the city by Eumaeus, gives him a, uh, Eumaeus gives him a staff to lean on so that he can beg his way through the city and survive, get some food, shelter, clothes. And they run across another one of Odysseus' old servants, this time the goat herd Melanthius. But Melanthius is rather insulting and, and mocks Odysseus and Eumaeus, um, which of course angers Odysseus a great deal. And here's a part of what he says. Look, he sneered, one scum nosing another scum along. Dirt finds dirt by the will of God, it never fails. Wretched pig boy, where do you take your filthy swine? This sickening beggar who licks the pots at feasts. Let me tell you, so help me it's the truth, if he sets foot in King Odysseus's royal palace, salvos of footstools flung at his head by all the lords will crack his ribs as he runs the line of fire through the house. So a rather insulting uh, series uh, of uh, statements made to Eumaeus and the beggar, who is, as we know, Odysseus in disguise, making Melanthius's statements rather ironic, although also, in, as we'll see, partially true. And then in what I find to be one of the most moving and sad moments of the poem, we see Argus, the loyal dog that Odysseus had left behind 20 years before. Okay, a bit unrealistic that the dog would still be alive, but possible. Now as they talked on, a dog that lay there lifted up his muzzle, pricked his ears. It was Argos, long enduring Odysseus's dog. He trained as a puppy once, but little joy he got since all too soon he shipped to sacred Troy. And we have this just very moving description of the, the poor old dog's last moment of joy seeing his master that he's longed for for so long. But now with his master gone, he lay there, cast away on piles of dung from mules and cattle, infested with ticks, half dead from neglect. Here lay the hound, old Argus. But the moment he sensed Odysseus standing by, he thumped his tail, nuzzling low, and his ears dropped, though he had no strength to drag himself an inch toward his master. 
Odysseus glanced to the side and flicked away a tear, hiding it from Eumaeus. But the dark shadow of death closed down on Argos's eyes the instant he saw Odysseus twenty years away. So it's a moment that reminds me in some sense of Odysseus's encounter with his mother in the underworld, that inability to have the one last um, hug, one last embrace, one last touch of comfort with the one that you love as the dog just can't seize his master, thumps his tail briefly, happily, but can't quite get himself close enough to be touched and then passes away. Um, a very moving, tragic uh, moment, especially for those of us who are pet lovers. Arriving in the palace, Odysseus, disguised as a beggar, comes in to get food, and Telemachus, of course, says, I welcome this stranger, I give him food. And at Athena's urging, Odysseus makes his rounds to all the other suitors, asking if they could, he could have some crust of bread or scrapes from their, scraps from their table. And the way she urges Odysseus is, is quite striking, given what she says, but what the poet then reveals. And now Athena came to the side of Laertes' royal son and urged him, go now, gather crusts from all the suitors, test them, so we can tell the innocent from the guilty. But not even so would Athena save one man from death. So there will be innocents and guilty uh, people in here, but they will all die. Um, despite her saying we should test them and sift out one from the other, they're still all going to be victims of Odysseus's vengeance, and there doesn't seem to be any moral or ethical qualm about that, which we might find rather disturbing. And of course, one suitor, Antinous, uh, behaves abominably and is very inhospitable, yelling about the presence of the, the beggar, and he, he yells at Eumaeus for bringing him your highness, swineherd, why drag this to town? Haven't we got our share of vagabonds to deal with, disgusting beggars who lick the feaster's plates? We might think of the irony of, of one of the suitors making this claim and uh, being angry at someone who just comes in and wastes and takes the goods and foods of another. And as Odysseus goes around, they all give him a little bit of food, except Antinous, who in fact strikes him, throws his footstool at him, just as the goat herd had predicted. And even the other suitors think that this is unacceptable, and they say, you're going to pay for this. There's, there's a karma. Things will come back to punish you if you do wrong to others, especially to the weak, to servants, to slaves, to guests and strangers. Uh, but Antinous doesn't seem to care. He's just a, a cruel jerk. As Penelope says, he's the worst of all of the suitors. Penelope, hearing about the stranger, asks to see him. She tells Eumaeus to bring him for an audience. And Eumaeus says, of course, and, and uh, he has a, a sad story, but he's spoken of Odysseus. And she says, well, you know, if only he were here to pay back these horrible suitors. Once more, another one of these wishes that we've seen more and more expressed throughout the last few books. Oh, if only Odysseus was here. Of course, he is here. That's the great irony that we as audience members know that the characters don't yet know. Um, and it's something it's building up that tension, that expectation that this will be fulfilled, that we're going to see their wishes come true eventually, but the tension, the suspense, the desire to see that finally happen is building through the narrative for us. And Odysseus sends back word. He says, well, I fear that the, the suitors will be cruel, so let's wait until evening after the sun has set, and then I will come visit her. And Penelope hearing this says, nobody's fool, that stranger, wise Penelope said. He sees how things could go. Surely no men on earth can match that gang for reckless, deadly schemes. So she says, yeah, he's smart. He knows that they might be dangerous uh, because who could, who could match them for uh, deadly plots? And of course, we know who can and will match them, Odysseus himself. So uh, a wonderful irony that Penelope recognizes him without quite recognizing him. Some questions for you to consider. Um, so in this book, and of course throughout the poem as a whole, we've seen loyal and disloyal servants. Um, how does, so some questions, thinking about why we see these different servants, what role they play. Are they just supporters of the heroic characters or do they have an importance in themselves? Um, so we could think about how does Homer tend to characterize servants in general? 
Um, what are the defining traits of loyal versus disloyal servants? What makes one loyal and another disloyal uh, in terms of their traits, their actions, the way they're described? And what events are foreshadowed by the encounter with the goat herd, one of the disloyal servants. What events does he foreshadow uh, both literally and perhaps ironically? Further questions about the servants. How do the events featuring servants in this book compare to those in previous books? Uh, and what ideas ultimately are we seeing about service and servitude? Uh, how is Homer portraying the class system of ancient Greece, the way the nobles viewed the lower classes, the way the lower classes viewed the nobles, how they interacted, what their responsibilities were to each other, what it meant to be a good servant or a bad servant, what it meant to be a good master or a bad master. Uh, is Homer just portraying this class system uh, objectively? Is he showing us any critical moments? Is, it? is he critical of it at all? Do we see any of the problems in this class system or is it held up just as a perfect way of life, a perfect order. Um, and just uh, sort of tangentially related, what's important and meaningful and powerful about the scene with Argus, the old dog? Again, thinking about this very domestic, very sort of pathetic scene, and I mean that not in a bad way, but pathetic in terms of the, the emotion that it, uh, that it calls forward. How is that function in a novel about heroism and a heroic return and a great warrior? What how does this moment with the dog um, either undercut or reinforce our ideas about heroism and what it means to be a hero? How does it show us a new side, a different side of Odysseus's heroism? And just a few more questions. Why does Athena wish Odysseus to test which suitors are innocent if she just is going to have them all be murdered, if they're all going to die? What's the point of that test? And what does this suggest about the ethics of the gods? Again, thinking about how the gods behave in their morality versus human morality and how humans have to, in some ways, adapt to what the gods believe and the way the gods run the world. Is it wrong for Odysseus to kill an innocent person? According to our moral standards, probably, but what about according to the ethical standards set in the poem? Should we feel bad about any of them dying? Should we feel angry with Odysseus? And this leads us perhaps to ask, what are the ethics of vengeance in a society dominated by a heroic code? How, if, if vengeance is a value, a virtue, something that one should pursue, something that makes one manly to pursue, um, how does that, what are the ethics of that vengeance and how does it fit into a larger moral code? Book 18, The Beggar King of Ithaca. Now along came this tramp, this public nuisance who used to scrounge a living round the streets of Ithaca, notorious for his belly, a ravenous bottomless pit for food and drink. But he had no pith, no brawn, despite the looming hulk that met your eyes. So this is our introduction to Arnaeus, or Iris, the beggar king of Ithaca, who will have a bit of a comic conflict with Odysseus. So Iris insults and threatens Odysseus, says, what are you doing here on this porch? Get out of here before I beat you. And Odysseus says, uh, you don't want to mess with me. And of course, Antinous, being the jerk that he is, says, hey, let's have a fight between these two poor beggars. Um, and we'll give the winner some goat sausages. So they, all the suitors get riled up for this bit of uh, entertainment, bit of rather cruel and demeaning entertainment of the two beggars. But that's the kind of guys they are. They, of course, expect to see something humorous given that what they see in front of them are two old, weak beggars. But when Odysseus, in his disguise as the old man, when he gets ready to fight, uh, they are shocked at what they see. And again, it's perhaps a foreshadowing of what's to come. 
Odysseus belted up, roping his rags around his loins, bearing his big, rippling thighs, his boxer's broad shoulders, his massive chest and burly arms on full display. Despite their swagger, the suitors were amazed. So another unveiling, a, a recognition scene, Odysseus is recognized in part, um, even though they don't know yet that it is him, but they can clearly recognize his great prowess, physical prowess. So we have a, a wonderful, entertaining moment where Odysseus considers how he should fight Iris, what he should do to knock this guy out. And it's uh, reminiscent a little bit if you've seen the first Sherlock Holmes movie with Robert Downey Jr., where he has the slow motion uh, anticipation of all the moves he's going to do in the battle. So Odysseus thinks, should he knock him senseless, leave him dead where he dropped, or just stretch him out on the ground with a light jab? He came through with a hook below the ear, pounding Iris's neck, smashing the bones inside. Suddenly red blood came spurting out of his mouth, and headlong down he pitched in the dust, howling, teeth locked in a grin, feet beating the ground. So one punch and, and Iris is on the ground. The suitors are all cheering at the, the entertaining fight they've just seen. Odysseus grabs Iris by the leg, drags him out, throws him out of the street. Antonus says, hey, here's your, here's your goat sausages that you've won, and, and he starts to eat those. And another suitor, Amphinomus, who we've seen as the, one of the more responsible, respectable suitors, he also praises Odysseus's victory. And Odysseus warns him, though, he says, something bad's going to come, just be, just be warned of it. And again, Amph Amphinomus is one of the innocent suitors, but of course we know he's going to die himself. Here's part of Odysseus's response when Amphinomus praises his victory. Odysseus says, here I see you suitors plotting your reckless work, carving away at the wealth, affronting the loyal wife of a man who won't be gone from kin and country long. I say he's right at hand and may some power save you. Once under his own roof, he and your friends, believe you me, won't part till blood has flowed. Amphinomus made his way back through the hall, his heart sick with anguish, shaking his head, fraught with grave forebodings. So he senses that something bad is going to happen, that the suitors are going to pay for their behavior. Then we see Penelope, who, being aware of everything that's going on, decides that she is going to appear before the suitors and chastise them and uh, make a grand appearance. So Athena enhances her beauty gives her a, a restful sleep and then makes her appear even more beautiful. And she goes to the main halls where at first she chastises her son Telemachus for allowing this fighting and for the abuse that's been given to a stranger, to both the strangers in her house. Telemachus, in a change from earlier, uh, humbly accepts his mother's chastisement. He says, mother, I cannot fault your anger at all this. My heart takes note of everything, feels it too both the good and the bad, the boy you knew is gone. So he's no longer a child, he's no longer immature, he knows what's right and wrong, but he says, but how can I plan my world in a sane, thoughtful way? These men drive me mad, hedging me round, right and left, plotting their lethal plots, and no one takes my side. So he knows that, that this shouldn't be occurring, but what can he do, given these madmen around him, the suitors? Penelope then goes on to chastise them, in particular for not being more generous in their wooing of her, in their courtship. She says, your way is a far cry from the time-honored way of suitors locked in rivalry, striving to win some noble woman, a, man's wealth, a wealthy man's daughter. They bring in their own calves and lambs to feast the friends of the bride-to-be, yes, and shower her with gleaming gifts as well. They don't devour the woman's goods scot-free. So she calls them out once more for their behavior. And they momentarily say, you know, you're right. And they all decide to go get gifts, to give her lavish gifts as they're supposed to. Odysseus likes this. He says, good job. My, my wife is so crafty and smart getting them to give her wealthy gifts instead of just wasting all of, of our money and food. 
once more we see the contrast between the loyal servants and the disloyal servants. Uh, Odysseus offers to help with the housework. He tells the maids, you go tend to your queen. I will uh, deal with the torches and everything with the suitors. And one of them, Melantho, mocks him. And she says, what are you talking about? Why don't, you know, you bum, you, you degenerate beggar. Um, and she mocks him, even though she is Penelope's maid and has been treated as a daughter by Penelope, she has no sympathy for her uh, for her mistress's anguish. And in fact, she's sleeping with one of the suitors, Eurymachus. So she seems to be a character of, of low morals, uh, at least according to the poet. And Odysseus yells at her and says, if I tell Telemachus, he'll chop you into a million little bits. And so the maids all flee from him in his anger. Rather harsh reply, but we do see again the difference between the loyal and the disloyal servants. And picking up on her earlier, the earlier statement that Athena would not let any of the suitors survive, she decides to deepen the conflict by making uh, uh, Odysseus even angrier at them, not holding them back from their insults. Athena had no mind to let the brazen suitors hold back now from their heart-rending insults. She meant to make the anguish cut still deeper into the core of Laertes' son, Odysseus. So she wants him even more angry, more anguished, so that his vengeance will be all the more glorious. And in the final closing uh, lines of the book 18, the suitors, they all despise the stranger. They mock him, yell at him. They wish that he wasn't there. Uh, but Telemachus says, look, he's welcome. He's my guest. I will make him uh, welcome, and, and you cannot treat him that way. And so Amphinomus, again, we see the, the good suitor, the noble suitor says, you know, that's a good proposal. I say, let's leave him all alone. Let's all leave him alone. Leave all the servants alone. Let's behave ourselves as we should, uh, according to the rules of hospitality. And with that, they, they toast and, of course, all go off to bed. All right, some questions for you to think about regarding Book 18. What might be represented or foreshadowed by Odysseus's battle with Iris, the beggar king? Um, who does the beggar king compare to? Who might we relate him to in this poem? Uh, and how does this conflict compare to Odysseus's earlier adventures, his earlier struggles and strifes? Is it similar? Is it an ironic sort of uh, reversal or inverse of them in any ways? How does he compare to Odysseus's other rivals and enemies? Again, both um, in, in sort of literal comparison, but also ironic comparisons. In what way does he serve as a counterpoint to the earlier adventures and conflicts? As well as a marker pointing towards what is going to happen in the rest of the poem as, as we go forward. And what is significant about the interchange between Penelope and Telemachus, between mother and son? How does it compare to their previous interactions, to what she has said to him, to how he has responded to her responses, um, to their, their relative sense of power and authority, who has status in their relationship? What do we see about how their relationship is developing, how they are developing as characters? Some final questions, overall questions about books 13 through 18. Um, how is the style of the second half of the poem, what we've seen since book 13, have you noticed any differences between it and the first half of the book? That could be in term of the, terms of the types of events, the types of characters, what the poet focuses on. Um, are the events different? Are there different types of events? Is the voice, is the mood different? Are, are there more comic elements, more tragic elements, more sentimental elements? Is it as heroic as, as previous? Is it more focused on domestic issues, political issues, heroic issues? What ideas or characters or images seem to draw the focus of the poet? So thinking about what is changing, how is the poem progressing? Why did we need those first 12 books um, to get us to books 13 through 24. So your next steps, um, make sure you review books 13 through 18. Uh, read them if you haven't already and review them again as soon as you get a chance. Uh, there's a quiz on them due on Wednesday. 
Um, then the second half of the week will be we'll finish up the Odyssey books 19 through 24. Uh, you make sure you watch the lectures that I post on those. Those will be posted shortly in the next day or two. And there will be an online quiz also posted in the next day or two, and that will be due this Friday. Um, and of course, any weekend assignments that you may have to do, any other uh, work, writing assignments and so forth, um, those will be due on their announced due dates. Um, if you have any questions, of course, feel free to contact me. You know how. Uh, otherwise, best wishes for the rest of this week.